Are we live? Are we live? Are we? Are we live? Everybody here? Drop me a comment. Let me know you've joined us. I'm a little bit late tonight. I apologize for that. Had a little soccer practice going down today that I just got home from. So, tell you what, some of you guys are used to me being on time on schedule. Y'all gonna have to bear with me through soccer season because I took on the role of coaching my son's soccer team, coaching both of them, and. Uh, it takes up a lot of time. I'm already finding out it takes up a lot more time than I thought it did. Um, but we're here, and I'm not prepared. I don't have any baits in here with me, so we're going to talk about them, and I'm going to reveal some new juice that's coming soon to a theater near you, as they might say. Well, we got a lot of folks jumping on here tonight. we got Colton Doc, JD, Craig Wallace, K. Perrin, Raging Cajun, Justin Cover, Crappieitis, Vic Pearsall, Kevin Jones, Kenneth Flag and some others that I missed up at the top, man. Appreciate you guys joining us tonight. So, we kind of talked about that little lipless crankbait deal uh, last night. Um, that bait's in there, man. It's a player. But I tell you, the number one bait right now for me is been it's the new the new clout stick bait from six cents we're really catching a lot of fish on those uh, we're catching the majority of our fish throughout the day is being caught on a weightless rigged um, clout and we're throwing it in the uh, watermelon blue flake color uh, that's been our best bait the last couple days uh, a frog a frog will still get you bit a little bit you'll have some some fish blow up on a frog especially if it's cloudy or early in the morning low light conditions uh, Throwing the old cowboy color and the spro frog, throwing the new six cents frog a little bit, but mostly, especially with my customers, because I only got one of the six cents frogs. With my customers, I am throwing a uh, the cowboy color and the spro popping frog. Somebody said the Aggies are up seven to nothing. Who are they playing? Are they playing anybody good? Uh, I did not even know the Aggies were playing tonight. I have been running the camel at both ends, as you might say. Uh, keep it moving. So we got. Uh, the clout, stick bait, we got the frog, the lipless crankbait, the quarter I am throwing the quarter ounce lipless crankbait a bunch right now, um, up shallow, that's my number one moving bait, um, and a wacky worm, we're wa wacky rigging a, uh, that new divine shaky head worm, it's a lot like a trick worm, got a little bit fatter tail, a little bit more action, got forward facing ribs, move some more water, so we are throwing the, uh, I'm trying to read comments <laughs> y'all are cracking me up dude um wacky rigging the divine shaky head worm putting half nail weight in the head throwing that in watermelon blue or watermelon red watermelon blue seems to be watermelon blue flake seems to be the best color right now and for my fifth bait uh if you want to go fish out deep and try to catch one big one they are out there and you can catch it's, you're not going to get very many bites but you want to go try to catch one uh, the big flutterspoon, big Joe Space flutterspoon, is my best bet out deep right now. Now, this is not in the top five baits because I haven't even thrown it yet, but I think I'm going to take it out and throw it for the first time tomorrow. So Mark, Mr. Mark's going to be on the trip with me tomorrow. He's going to get a first-hand look at this. This is a new, I might get in trouble. I don't know if I'm supposed to show this or not. This is a prototype bait from Six Cents that hasn't come out yet, but it's a new jointed wake bait. So yeah. That sucker. It look it looks like it's gonna be like you can just imagine this swinging behind a wake bait that's wobbling real hard. Like, boy, I'm just telling you, this might be kind of a deal right here. This fall, when them shad really make that push, and they're back there over the around that shallow grass, and I can go right over the top of it with that right there. I think that might be something, something pretty special right there. So. All right, somebody, you guys are cracking me up. They, they're playing, apparently the Aggies are playing Texas State tonight, and somebody said they're playing the third shift at Walmart. <laughs> I used to always say they're playing Sister Mary's School for the Blind. Um, sweet looking weight, but yes it is. Howdy, howdy, howdy. Um, somebody's asking about updates on the Fish Life package. Yeah, Lake Fork, all the Fish Life packages will be updated this weekend um, after this weekend so this weekend you'll still have the current info that's on there now but after this weekend so next week is when all the updates will be live on the fish life app 
what's the shallowest you'd throw a flutter spoon? Well, I have different sizes of flutter spoon. I actually have all different sizes, shapes, and styles of flutter spoons. I've thrown flutter spoon in shallow grass before, but I have a smaller flutter spoon with a single hook instead of a treble hook that is specifically designed for that. So, I throw flutter spoons in all different depths, but as far as the a big seven inch treble hook flood, traditional giant hubcap of a bait flutter spoon I would say I probably wouldn't throw it much deep much shallower than you know like 10 feet on offshore structure that's clean with no timber 8 to 10 feet would be about the shallowest I don't know that I've ever thrown it that shallow usually I'm throwing it anywhere from like 15 to 25 feet is, is about where I'm throwing the uh, spoon somebody says so sad about Monticello it's very the Lake Monticello deal is a very sad state of affairs right now. It really is. Let's see what other questions we got. Going to fish Falcon Lake on Monday. Monday, any advice on what to use? Well, I would say um, I haven't been to Falcon since the winter, um, so I don't know personally. But we do have Lake Falcon on the app, and let me tell you this. Lake Falcon, we have a big bass contest every month on the app. So if you're using the Fish Life app, you're subscribed to a package. If you catch a big fish using the app, you send it to us, and that fish gets entered for Big Bass of the Month contest every month. Well, in June and July, Lake Falcon won. There was double-digit class fish caught off Lake Falcon using our app the last two months. So I would highly suggest checking out the information on that Fish Life app on Lake Falcon. Go look at that. Any advice on Hubbard this week? Well, I would think right now fish are starting to try and transition. I know on the app package for Hubbard we have some rocks marked. I would think that those rocks, those shallow rocks, would start to be a player. I think the river's gonna, the river always plays on Hubbard, but I think it's going to be more of a player going forward from now. Uh, the water did trend cooler this last week with that little rain and little cooler weather we had i mean it was 90 something but it was cooler than what it had been and it, it was enough to make the water temp drop a couple three degrees um that so that kind of to me made some of these fish start kind of shifting up you know up and in you know up into the bank in that scenario i think the rocks and the river especially the mouth of the river are going to be really good um i think that's going to be your best bet we're kind of going through turnover, turnover phase right now a little bit. Like I saw a lot of bryzone sacks on Lake Fork today, so there's some lakes that some areas of the lake that are turning over a little bit right now. So you know when turnover comes, man, the bite's tough, guys. It, it can be tough, but um, it's not a hard turnover. It's not anything that's like a real drastic deal, but it is making a little bit of a scattered bite, man. We're we're starting to get that late summer early fall deal where you see a lot of little fish you start catching a bunch of little ones I don't, if you guys fish you're in you're out throughout the year you'll know what i'm talking about but every year we get to kind of the end of august and going into september and even sometimes early october where these young of the year fish some of these fish that were born in february and march they're starting to get big enough to really bite your bait good and they're in big groups they're still running in big packs and they show up and you just start catching a bunch of these little tiny dinks um, that we're starting to see some of that, uh, and that's going to continue for the next month. It's twenty-eight to nothing. Ain't him beating Texas State twenty-eight to nothing. I wonder how big the the check that Texas State got from A and M is. It's got to be pretty big. Go up there and take a beating like that. turnover so fishing shallow yeah i am mostly fishing shallow you can still go out and grind out a deep bite here or there like one bite two bites like just a couple here and there um but i am predominantly fishing shallow right now for me this week has been much better shallow and like i said we're catching fish but we're catching a lot of small fish we're not catching a lot of good fish right now what up below jeff partridge oh jeff partridge is in the house tonight We got people in here trying to make fishing plans in the comments. I like it. I like it. I like it. Let's see. Since they opened the dam to Sandlin, how is that going to play in the fish quality left in Monticello? That dam has been open for almost two years. So it's whatever it was going to do to it, it's already done to it. Like it's still Monticello. It's still good. 
I mean, some of them went over there, of course. And some of the sand bass and spotted bass from Sandlin came into Monticello, but, I mean, it's still an awesome fishery. But the way the dam works on Monticello is the gates just lift straight up like this and the water flows out underneath them, so there's no boat access. Even if you were willing to break the law, there's no way to get a boat from Sandlin to Monticello. Um, and I've heard the rumors about them, like they're going to cut a hole in the dam. That's, there's no truth to any of that. What's the best way bait-wise to fish the shallow grass? Uh, well, just what we talked about tonight. I mean, that's what I'm doing. So the weightless uh, stick bait, the clout, new clout stick bait for six cents, that's what I'm using. It's working really well. That's getting most of our bites. The lipless crankbait is starting to work. They bit it better yesterday than they did today but part of that is because I didn't throw it as much today because they were biting the stick bait so um, and the frog so weightless stick bait or wacky worm you can wacky worm them too um, lipless crankbait and a frog that's that's the best way to me to fish that shallow grass right now <laughs> Raging Cajun said he's been fishing for three days but out on a drilling rig Needless to say, it's not the fishing you wanted to do. I bet not. Out there dropping a line off the platform, baby. Do you believe Monticello will open again? Man, that, there's no way to know the answer to that right now. I mean, in the back of my head, like, and in my heart, like, I'm like, yeah. It, eventually, you know, I'm thinking, surely, eventually, something will get figured out on that deal. But there's no, like, plans in the foreseeable future. There's no clear path to that happening right now so I don't I don't know flying the Lake Fork on Thursday September 5th is your live update on Thursday again next week yeah we do a live stream right here every week Thursday nights at 8:30. we do a live stream where we talk about top five baits we also do um, seminars every other Friday night we have a seminar a free seminar at Lake Fork Marina tomorrow evening at 6 p.m. Uh, and then two weeks from tomorrow, we'll have it again. So I don't know how long you're staying in town for. Uh, if you're not staying in town that long, you'll probably miss out on that. But if you're staying in town for a week or so, then you should come to one of our seminars as well. We'd love to, love to meet you. Staying for 10 days. So yeah, so, not, so two weeks from tomorrow, after you get here, two weeks from tomorrow, that Friday, we will have a seminar at 6 p.m. at Lake Fort Marina. So stop on by. Have they started moving to secondary points yet? Yep. Yeah. That. I mean, they're not like really getting in there yet, but they're just start. There's just some fish starting to really show up in groups on those. Um, just the very front edge of it. But that's the deal that's coming to us. Like, especially if we get any more kind of a cool down at all, where the water temps drop just a little bit, there'll be more and more of them pile in there. Billy, are the fall water temps like the spring? When water temps cool down after a front, do you need three consecutive cooler days of the cooler temps before fish make a move? No, everything happens a lot faster in the fall. Um, I'm not real sure why it just does. But I will tell you this. What you want to look for in the fall for a big temperature swing is kind of, it's like the spring, but it's the opposite. So in the springtime, we look for warm nights. Warm nights where the, the, the air temperatures at night never get below the water temperature. So if you're in January and February and the water temperature is 48 degrees, well, when you have those warm nights that are in the mid-50s, well, the water never has a cooling cycle. So it never cools back down at night, and it makes it warm up really, really fast. Well, right now it's the opposite. So what you want to look for is daytime air temps. Like right now, the water temps today were like 87-ish. Uh, they'll probably climb back up after today because it was really hot today, so like 88, 89. So when we have our first days, our first couple days where the, the high is not above 88, so the high for the day is 83 or 80 or 84, whatever it is, when it's below the water temp, that water will never have a warming cycle throughout the day and the water temp will drop real quick. Uh, and when that happens, that fall movement will happen almost overnight. Like it'll, they'll start migrating real, like it'll go real quick when that happens. Uh, can I explain what a secondary point is new to the lingo here? Absolutely, Colton. So 
to me, a secondary point, and I've heard different people have different opinions on this, but for me, so let's say all this up here is water, and this down here is land, so this is a point. Well, this point, this is the main lake. The wide open lake is over here, and this is a creek going back in, you know, we're going back into a creek arm right here. Well, this is a main lake point that points at the main lake. That's a main lake point. Well, if you have another point that kicks out right here and points this way, it, it points, it's inside the mouth of the creek and it points out into the creek, that's a secondary point. So to me, points, uh, secondary points are points that are located inside the mouth of a creek or inside a pocket or inside a cove. Main, there's main lake points and there's secondary points. So I hope that explains it to you. What about Zeke? My thoughts on Zeke. You know, I tend to, uh, man, I'm like really conservative in a lot of ways. Um, but I tend to be a little more open-minded. I'm like really fiscally and government. I want small government. I want to be fiscally conservative. When it comes to social issues, I tend to be a little more liberal. Um, these rookies in the NFL are signed to these contracts, and it's like a designated number. Like they don't get to negotiate for their price. So I'm all about being a team player. When I played ball, I was all about sacrificing for the team and all that. I wanted guys on the team that were willing to do that too. And I get that, but it's a job. It's a profession. And these running backs have a very short shelf life. Like, they're probably only going to get one big contract. And Zeke and all these other running backs are very aware that they're one injury away from never making any significant money to last them a lifetime. Um, and that's what you have to do. If that's what you do for a living, like, you got to make it all in a hurry. You pay a physical price for it, but, you know, that's the way that game works. I'm not mad at Zeke for holding out. But when they offer him the money they offered him, for him to not just sign that dotted line for that kind of money seems ridiculous. I'm not against the principle of Zeke holding out to get paid because he's one of the greatest running backs in football. I have no problem with that. What I do have a problem with is they gave you a very fair deal and you turn it down. Now you're just being selfish and greedy. It's gone beyond you're trying to take care of yourself. You're just being kind of a jerk. So that's where I'm at on Zeke. You guys are dropping some comments now. Uh, let's see. Backyard Bassin says, dude, I really appreciate you being real. There's a lot of people out there trying to explain the textbook way things should work, not the actual way it is. Man, I try to keep it real. You know, I, I, I learned a lot about what I know um, just because I was desperate for information. I I started out with a guy, you know, as a guy that didn't have a big extensive background in tournament fishing or anything like that. Uh, when I first moved here and I just got obsessed with Lake Fork and I watched every fishing show I could and I read every article I could and I read every forum that I could and I, I gathered as much information as I could and then I just went out and crack at it kind of the old fashioned way. Uh, and so once I became a guide, I wanted to make sure that, you know, especially using these social media platforms, I want to try to teach it to you guys the same way that I learned it and uh, try to give you guys as much helpful information as I can. Now, that doesn't mean my way is always the right way, but I'm going to tell you the way I learned it. And I think it naturally kind of is relatable to some of you guys because y'all are just like I was. And, you know, when I, before I was fortunate enough to figure out how to fish every day, I was desperate and wanting to learn. And I had to learn things the way that it worked for me. And I think some of you guys, it worked for y'all too. So I appreciate you saying that. I really do. It means a lot. Um, and, I, and I hope it does work. Is the spoon bite dead? And if so, will it, when will it come back? No, the spoon bite's not dead. It's just, they're, they'll still bite the spoon. It's just a tough bite, man. It's just a one, once in a while bite. Like it's, there's just not a lot of ways to go out deep and catch fish. A lot. Like the majority of those fish that are offshore are just kind of suspended. The bait's real high. Like look on your graph. You'll see a lot of bait real high in the water column. And those fish are just kind of roaming around with them. 
So it's kind of hard to get that spoon in their face enough times to make them bite it because they're just roaming with that bait, you know. And sometimes they're correlating the structure, but sometimes they're out in the middle of nowhere. And man, that's a that's a needle in a haystack scenario, and that's why it's kind of tough. Somebody says we don't need improved it last week with the backup running back. Okay, okay, hold on, folks. Blake Horton, I appreciate what you're saying, and that kid looked real good in a preseason game against preseason defense. Um, make no mistake about it. In the preseason in the NFL, even when they got the starters in there, them boys ain't – that's not a real game. They ain't laying it all on the line. They're just trying to get some reps. It's a practice. They're trying to get reps and not get injured. That's all they're trying to do. Zeke makes whatever team he's on better. Now, he needs an offensive line, but the Cowboys got the offensive line. And, yeah, I think the Cowboys can play some good football without Zeke because um, they do have a good offensive line. But Zeke is a difference maker, big time. Like, you do need him. You do want him on your team. Uh, when do I think that new six-inch weight bait will come into play on my deck every day? Um, probably – no more than a month from now. Like, when we when the water temps really start dropping and those fish really start migrating towards the back of a creek in a big way, I think that wake bait's going to be a real player, man. I'm excited. It's a good sized, it's a perfect size shad profile. Um, it looks just like, you know, a lot of the mature thread fin or the, the young of the year gizzard shad that are in the lake in the fall. I think it's going to catch some really big fish. And it's Looks like with that, you know, joint and tail on that wake bait, man, it should have a ton of action to it, which will really draw them in from a long area. I'm really excited. I think that's going to be a really, really good bait this fall. Uh, your information and tips easily transition to other lakes and climates. Our turnover started up here in the Northwoods about three weeks ago. The info has helped with the fishing strategy up here also. Man, that's awesome. Thank you so much. I appreciate you watching, and I'm really, really, really glad that it does help. That's really cool. When do your lakes typically start to turn over temp-wise? I know that question is for down the road. No, it's not. That question is not for down the road. That question is not for down the road. Um, temp-wise, you know, it... <laughs> It depends on how hot it is. Um, if the temps have been, you know, like sometimes around here, like Lake Fork will get 95, you know, 95 degree water on it. When that's happening, then the turnover happens at a higher temperature. Um, it all depends on how, you know, where the thermocline set, how deep it is, how hot it's been, how long it's been hot. There is a lot of uh, factors that go into that. And, and all that matters is you know, cold water is heavier than warm water. So in the summertime, the hot water's on the surface and it's cooler the deeper you go. Well, when this surface temperature water reaches the same temperature as this down here, or when this surface temperature water gets cooled and it actually becomes cooler than this down here, it goes, it flips and everything just mixes up. Um, and that's what causes it. So you can see a turnover in the 80s. You can see it not happen until the water breaks down into the 70s. But usually by the time you've hit that 80 degree mark and get into the 70s, it's happening. If it's going to happen, it's happened. Uh, <clears throat> uh, Patrick Conley says, I'm from North Carolina. They're all up in the trees. What bait should I throw to not get hung up? Well, if you're talking about like flooded trees, flooded cover like that, you kind of, when it gets to that scenario, you got about two options. You can flip and you can frog. And that's kind of your best bet. You can throw a swim jig, skip a swim jig, and kind of swim that out there a little bit. But if you really want to stay not hung up, you can go flipping and you can go frogging. And that's about all you can do. Need to come down and do a live stream with you so I can pick your brain a little bit. Oh, wait. Kick me down. I didn't get to read all that. Pay for the guy. <laughs> come down and do a live stream with me. Heck, yeah. We need to do that one at Bass Pro we were talking about doing. That's what we need to do. And then all you guys can come to it. Coming to fish with me next year for your senior trip. Can't wait. That's going to be awesome. Elite Vintage. Man, I can't wait to meet you, buddy. We're going to have a good time. I'll guarantee you that. 
apparently Cody Mays is up here making jokes because people are telling him how wrong he is. I missed it, though. I haven't seen Dallas fans this excited since Brokeback Mountain came out. Oh, my God. That's what everybody's talking about. Wow. Wow. Yeah, that's pretty rough there. Billy, are you fishing your wacky rig with a nail in the head in the grass? Yes. When I'm wacky rigging the divine shaky head worm, I'm putting a half a nail weight in the head. Yes, sir. I sure am. Best baits for millfold just under the surface, zero to one feet when they won't consistently hit a top water. When I have millfoil, I love, and it's just below the surface, I absolutely love to run a weedless swim bait over the top of it. Because the weedless swim bait, won't, if when it gets down in it, it doesn't hang up. And uh, it, you can cover a big area of that millfoil efficiently with that weedless swim bait and they bite it really good. That's my favorite way you go about that. Fish Bite says, how's it going? How's it going with you, buddy? Did I see the Texans running back got his ACL torn the first run he made last week? Yeah, Lamar Miller, that was a bad deal. But the Texans, I mean, it worked out. Hey, they had just traded for some depth at running back with Duke Johnson. Duke Johnson's a pretty solid player now, uh, and he's going to fit that offense real well. He's good. He, he's a good pass-catching running back, I think. Uh, Duke Johnson is going to be a very, very, very effective player for the Houston Texans. I think that offense is going to be pretty good. Still got DeAndre Hopkins. Still got Deshaun Watson. Um, the Houston Texans, a lot's going to depend on defense. They're going to have to, you know, J.J., his health is a little bit of an issue with old J.J. Watt. So we're just going to have to see uh, how that defense can play. They lost, they lost some good players out of the secondary down there for the Houston Texans. So it'll be uh, – that defense is going to make or break that team. We'll find out. We'll find out. But the offense should be fine. They got they're set up pretty well on offense. What's your favorite place to throw a shaky head? Well, uh, if it's a big shaky head, I like throwing it out deep on Maylake structure. I like throwing that big shaky head on Maylake points, humps, road beds, pond dams, all that stuff. Um, but a regular like finesse shaky head, like a quarter ounce shaky head. You know, I really like to fish those around docks, um, and I really like to fish those on secondary points in the fall. I think I think a, a quarter-ounce shaky head and a straight tail worm is one of the best baits you can throw when you get to November um, and, and in October, too. And I like to throw it on secondary points where I can identify schools of fish on my graph, and I like to throw it around docks that correlate with, you know, kind of transition areas where fish will migrate through. I think they like to use docks as stop signs when those correlate with the migration route. And I really like a shaky head in that situation. Billy, do the bass school by the dam on fork this time of year like they do on pines? Somewhat, sometimes. Uh, you know, for whatever reason, and I can't, I don't really know the answer to this, but there's certain lakes. Now, bass will school on any lake. They will school when the conditions are right on any lake. But for some reason, there's certain lakes that the bass will really, really school on. Uh, Lake Athens. The bass will school like crazy on Lake Athens. Lake Holbrook. Bass school like crazy on Lake Holbrook. On Lake Fork, for whatever reason, largemouth bass just do not school um, as much as they do on some other fisheries around here. I don't know why. They do do it. You do see it. Like, it happens. But it's not nearly as often and nearly as consistent and nearly as big of a pattern on Lake Fork as it is at some other lakes. Went and got two poachers and light hitch, a convict, big perm and green pumpkin, and plum, and bubble fry chartreuse and red flake and black flake at Lake Fork Marina today. Hey, those are all, you've seen all of those on this channel. Those are all good baits. <laughs> All uh, right, somebody just want to know, uh, M Ranger 250 is asking, Billy, is there an advantage to fishing a wacky rig on a spinning rod? Uh, castability. I don't like fishing spinning rods, and I'm going to tell you why. I mean, I call them fairy wands or whatever, but, dude, I got some medium action rods that are more limber than my spinning rods. So it's not about the rod not having power. 
it's about the bait caster. I can just I can pick up so much more line with a bait caster than I can with a spinning rod. And when I'm fighting a fish, man, I just I'm really not comfortable trying to keep up. Man, these fish around here, they will run at you, run away from you, run hard. And, and it's fine on a spinning rod when they're running away from you. But man, when they run at you, you gotta be able to catch up to them. And I've lost a lot of fish on spinning rods because I can't keep up to them when they run at me. Um, and that's the reason that I really try to, I'll throw it, everything. There's nothing that I'll pick up a spinning rod for. I will throw a wacky rig or whatever on a bait caster, no matter how light it is. Uh, I've been throwing a bait caster a long time so I can handle the casting part of it. And I'm just more comfortable that way. So it's just a personal deal. Cody Mays, I appreciate you, buddy. Thank you for that comment. Uh, here's a good question. Do you have advice on reading material about bass behavior, or is it a trial and error? You know, I never really read a lot of books. I read some old Bassmaster articles and stuff like that. Um, it's a lot of trial and error. There's no substitute for time on the water. But also, you know, for me, I, I really... I learned better and I, I enjoyed it more when I was learning when I absorbed video content. Um, I think that's one of the reasons I, I've been so adamant about doing the YouTube deal and stuck with it and wanted to do it so much is, man, that's how I learned. I looked up every YouTube video I could back when YouTube wasn't really a thing. And I watched every, I record, like literally my back in the day when we all had satellite TV or cable TV, we all had DVRs, like I had Every I would search, go out and search my DVR, my, my programming guide for fishing shows, and I recorded all of them, and I watched every one I could, and, and I watched them, and I paid attention to details. And if you pay attention to these shows, they'll tell you what time of year it is, uh, what the seasonal, what season it is, um, what the fish are biting, what base they're biting, how they're biting. You know, they give you all these clues, and you you absorb all these details. And then you try to put that puzzle together on your own water and make it relate to what you're fishing. And for me, that's how I learned. That's how I learned how fish move. Also, you know, I had the advantage of, man, I just, I grew up in the woods. So I kind of had a natural understanding of Mother Nature because I spent so much time outside in the woods hunting, fishing, whatever. I know how the seasonal patterns work. I know that the animals behave differently this time of year versus this time of year. Um... And that was stuff that I got as a kid, and I was lucky to have that in my life. But um, I think guys that are in tune with Mother Nature have an event. You know, Gerald Swindle's really good about this. Like, I notice when the leaves start turning colors, and I notice when certain grasses and flowers are blooming. And these are clues to what's going on in Mother Nature. Like, I noticed today. Uh, there were some big oak trees in a yard near where we were fishing and acorns were already falling. Well, that's telling me that this deal is coming. Like, that's telling me that this transition from summer to fall, it's starting to happen. When those acorns start falling, it's happening, guys. Like, <laughs> that's not... Like, Mother Nature will not lie to you. She's not going to lie to you. And if you can absorb these clues, you can kind of be ahead of the curve and be ahead of the game. And I think guys that are in tune with Mother Nature have an advantage that way. And... I think it's one of my strengths that I absorb things just like today, acorns fall. Well, instead of me trying to think, well, hey, it's August, it's still summer, I'm thinking about, okay, they're transitioning. Um, and the last couple of days it's paid off, we've caught a good number of fish. So, How far do you stay from docks while flipping them and skipping them? Well, I need to do... With dock fishing is seem to be a hot topic here lately. I need to do a really in-depth video for you guys where I show you guys how I approach a dock and how I fish it. But a general thesis is I work out to in. So I want to make, I want to stay, how do I say this? Um, when I make my first cast at a dock, the first thing I want to do is hit the outside corners. And I want to be a distance away where I can make a good cast. I want to be as far away as I can and still make a good controlled cast that lands softly next to the outside corners. And I'm gonna fish the outside edge of that dock first, and then I'm gonna work my way around one side or the other. And I'm usually, I'm gonna pick the shadiest side. So if the sun's over here, I'm gonna start on this side of the dock. 
If the sun's kind of up in the middle, it, I'm probably going to pick the deeper side of the dock. If the sun's this side, I'm going to pick this side of the dock. And I always start from the outside in. The reason I do that is if there's fish on that outside edge, I don't want to go up there and flip the back corner first and run my boat over those fish that are sitting on the outside edge. So I always fish a dock from as comfortable distance as I can while making soft landing casts on the edges. And then I'll move a little closer and I'll skip under the outside. And then I'll move around the side and start working the edges and skipping under the sides and then get around on the walkway and all that. And I just work out the end. Um, I don't know. I think I need to do that and kind of visually show you guys and really break it down in depth so you really understand, but hopefully that makes sense and you can kind of understand that. <laughs> Mike Sims says, sometimes he likes to flip in an umbrella hole in the middle of a dock. So there's there's a little story behind that. Uh, me and Mike Sims, Mike Sims was out on a guide trip with me, and uh, I think we were sight fishing mostly, but we, we went by this, there was a floating dock uh, it was just, and you couldn't get under it because the whole dock was just floating on the surface. Like it was just a pad. It wasn't even a dock. It was just like a little, it wasn't a boathouse or nothing. It was just a little platform you could walk out on and it floated right on the water. So there's no way to get under it. But there was a hole in the middle of it. it. looked like you could stick an umbrella thing down in. And I just made a flip and my bait landed right in the hole and I went underneath the dock. <laughs> you know, I told Sims, I said, I don't know if one bites it, how I'm going to get it out because he's ain't going to fit through that hole. But <laughs> I don't even know why I flipped it in there. I just did. Is down imaging, oh, we missed that, we missed that. Is down imaging useless on the bow? Have heard you had to be moving at least three to five miles an hour for it to work, but I think they was talking about side imaging. Um, yeah, no, I don't use down imaging on the bow. Um, you do need to be moving. Otherwise, you're just instead of seeing a clear dot, you're going to see a line. Just like on sonar, on sonar you'll see an arc when you're moving, but when that fish swims under your trouble motor, he's just a straight caterpillar. Well, that dot that's on your down imaging is going to become a line, and it's going to take away the strength of down imaging because anything that's underneath you, whether it's a tree or whether it's a brush pile, whether it's you know an old bridge, whatever it is, or if it's fish, they're all just going to be a straight line going across your graph. It's going to be really hard to read that and decipher what it is. And with sonar, you get a good density reading. You can kind of it's clearer. You can kind of see better looking straight down when you're at a standstill with sonar than you can with down image. So. Useless, I don't know if I'd say useless, but I think sonar is a better option when you're stationary. Thumbs up on the dock video. We'll have to do that one. That's one I definitely have on my list to get done. Wow, we've been going a long time, and there's a lot of you in here still. That's awesome. You know what? We're going to go ahead and wrap this up because I still have to eat dinner, and i got to go to the lake at 5 in the morning. So... Hey, man, just want to say thank you guys so much for joining us. I know we did live God's Network last night. We did live stream tonight. We got a seminar tomorrow. Uh, we're just going to keep on keeping on, baby, doing what we do. Um, yeah, I guess that's about it, man. Appreciate you joining us. Good luck to all you guys that are fishing this weekend. It's tough out there right now. I know it's tough, but uh, get out there and grind on them. You never know. We caught a giant earlier this week, so you never know when uh, that big fish is going to bite. Hey, thank you guys for watching. We'll see you next time right here on Your Lake Fort Guy.